Well, let me say to begin with, I think it's great that Occupy Boston is taking a stand against corporate greed, against the many manifestations of inequality and injustice in our economy today. One of the important ones to understand that takes a few steps, is a little bit complicated, is the ways in which our economic system is causing the Earth's climate to change for the worse, perhaps irreversibly. So I want to talk about that in several stages. First, a uh, quick review of the three things that you need to know about the science. Then talk a bit about why capitalism causes environmental problems like climate change. And then talk about what we'll need to do to solve the problem. The science can be very complicated. I think there are three big things you need to know. One is how the greenhouse effect works. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere acts like glass in a greenhouse or in your car window when you park in the sun. Light comes in, hits something there, and turns to heat. The glass or the carbon dioxide is transparent to light, but not to heat. So the light comes in, turns to heat, and the heat is trapped there. Uh, that's it. That's the greenhouse effect. It's uh, established science. It's been known since the 19th century. The second important thing is how narrow the tolerance of the Earth's systems are for temperature changes, at least for Earth systems that we're going to survive. The human race evolved in a very narrow range of temperatures and relatively small average deviations in either direction can undermine that. Five degrees Celsius, that's nine degrees Fahrenheit, change in either direction is a catastrophe. Uh, that much colder, five degrees Celsius colder, is the temperature of the last ice age. New York, Chicago, London, and other cities were covered with ice. Uh, great for polar bears. Five degrees Celsius warmer hasn't happened for 30 million years. The last time it happened, uh, the world was covered with swampy forests. There were alligators near the North Pole. So uh, a few degrees warmer is good for alligators. A few degrees colder is good for polar bears. We are the Goldilocks species, right in the middle, not too hot, not too cold. And relatively small changes in that undermine the conditions of life for which our species evolved. And the third thing that's important to know about it is how slowly the system changes, the incredible inertia in the system. Carbon dioxide, some part of it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. The oceans warm up and cool down on a scale of many centuries. So starting a change takes a long time and stopping a change takes a long time. So the fact that we're starting to see the climate changing already, even though it hasn't changed much, is very bad news because it means that that incredible process of turning the Earth's system in a more dangerous direction has already occurred and it's going to take decades to turn it back. So that's, that's what you need to know about the science. In terms of the economics, our economic system encourages people to profit in whatever ways they can to make money for themselves, for their companies, in whatever ways they can. And in addition to the unfairness to other people, to the 99%, there's an impact on the natural environment. Anytime you're allowed to, you can make money by doing something environmentally destructive and having other people pay for the consequences. And that's very much the case with climate change. It's very profitable to burn fossil fuels. It's, uh, it's been the engine of industrialization. And leaving that, leaving the consequences of that for other people to pay for is, of course, what you want to do if you're maximizing sharp run profit. The system encourages that. The struggle to get polluters to pay for the pollution they cause is the battle of environmental policy. There have been some successes on some environmental issues. There's not been much success yet on getting those who emit carbon dioxide, those who profit from large amounts of fossil fuel emissions, to pay for the damages that are done. Uh, there is, it's even worse than that. There's a whole world of subsidies for fossil fuel use, subsidies for the oil industry, uh, the uh, subsidies for offshore drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, which lead to the problems that we saw there. Uh, and after a century and more of fossil fuel fueled industrialization, there's such a wealth of experience built up in technologies that use fossil fuels productively, technologies that manipulate 
the world, the material environment productively using fossil fuels are much better developed than alternative technologies that would accomplish the same things without using fossil fuels. So that the attempt to create renewable technologies starts at a disadvantage built up by a century and more of extremely profitable use of fossil fuels that has dumped this pollution into the environment without worrying about it. So, in, I could go on about the harms caused by climate change uh, or about the economics of it. I, I think that what's important to understand is that this is a slow-moving crisis, but it is moving and it's going to be quite slow to stop, too. The scientific research suggests that tipping points are going to be reached probably within the generation of today's young adults, within the lifespan of people who are young adults today. If we don't change our course, tipping points like the point at which the complete loss of the Greenland ice sheet becomes irreversible, the point at which uh, acidification of the oceans destroys the coral reefs and much of the ocean life that fishing depends on. A, a number of tipping points like that, which are very hard to come back from, probably can't come back from them in a uh, time that's meaningful to human life, uh, could be reached within this century if we don't change. And things will only get worse as time goes on. It doesn't stop in the year 2100. So the challenge then in overcoming corporate greed in creating a better way of life and a sustainable economy is to figure out how to replace the things that cause those emissions, which has a technological component and a more challenging political component. The, the technologies, the questions of creating ways to create electricity and to create transportation, those are the, the top two. They're not the only things that matter, but the top two sources of carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse emissions are electricity and transportation. And there's a whole world of technologies. Electricity is the easier of the two to replace. We know how to create electricity from wind and solar power. Onshore wind power in some locations is now practically competitive with other sources of electricity. Offshore wind and solar are not yet, but their costs are coming down. There's a lot that can be done with energy efficiency to lower the amount of energy that we need to use to achieve the same services. This is not going to happen easily. There are a lot of extremely powerful corporations and their best friends in Congress who are committed to not doing that. But it is technologically possible at a not too enormous cost at this point to have a transition in the course of this century to a really fossil fuel free electrical system. Transportation is a greater challenge. It's hard to figure out how to have individual vehicles fueled without fossil fuels. It is possible, but it's that'll be that'll be the second and more difficult challenge. Uh, funding for mass transit, getting people to drive sensible-sized vehicles, and developing the technologies and the the infrastructure for fueling an alternative. Uh, system of transportation will probably be the challenge for the second half of this century, assuming that we succeed in the first half of the century in creating a fossil fuel-free electrical system. Uh, so those are, those are the technological challenges that are absolutely required, not only in this country but around the world, in order to solve the problem. The, the politics of achieving this is much more difficult. Our Congress, our political uh, system, the chattering classes in Washington, are full of people who are strangely committed to denying basic science, to, uh, to rejecting the nearly unanimous opinions of the scientific world. This is the best research scientific problem in history. There is nothing which humanity has ever known as much about scientifically as climate change. Uh, incredibly well-funded attempts to discredit it have found nothing more than typographical errors. A uh, set of stolen emails from some climate researchers revealed the shocking news that leading scientists are rude and competitive when they write to each other. Uh, who knew? Uh, 
not much else. Uh, the repeated investigations have shown that nothing else was going on. So overcoming that, not only people who are committed to economic inequality, to favoring the rich, but are strangely committed to denying modern science. Uh, but we have one party of endless denial and one party of endless compromise. Uh, the Democrats have not really distinguished themselves in standing up for this issue and in proposing that we do something about it. The urgency of the problem, the fact that this slow-moving but slow-to-start, slow-to-stop catastrophe is coming our way requires action within the next decade. It requires turning the whole economic system around so that by mid-century it looks very different than it does today. By the end of the century it looks like something that would seem like science fiction to us today sitting here uh, enjoying the noise of uh, fossil fuel powered engines all around us. Uh, that uh, quieter, cleaner systems of transportation, cleaner systems of electricity, a different way of organizing the economy is absolutely required. The problem is even more difficult than that in that this is one of the richest and least affected countries in the world, and other countries in the world feel quite rightly that we are responsible for uh, a good share of their problems. We have the resources to do something about it more than they do, uh, and we have filled the atmosphere with emissions from our history of industrialization, leaving no room for them to industrialize along the same lines. So that as hard as it is to win agreement in the U.S., it is absolutely crucial because it's a global problem. It is absolutely crucial to address it on a global level, and that is going to require the U.S. paying for a more than proportionate share of solving the problem. There's no way that China and India and all the other industrializing countries will get on board with a solution that does not include that. Uh, how much will it cost? Uh, the best estimates suggest 2 to 3 percent of gross world product, 2 to 3 percent of what we produce in the world uh, for a long time to come, you know, for decades to come, is the order of magnitude of the investment that's required. Uh, this sounds, on the one hand, incredibly expensive. On the other hand, if you say, can we afford to take 2 or 3 percent out of what we produce, not consume it, but spend it on long-term threats to our security, the answer is that we already do. We spend it on defending against largely imaginary military threats. Both the United States and China spend more than 4 percent of their national incomes on the military. Nobody is going to invade the United States or China if they spend one-third that much. Uh, these are not invadable countries. So that legitimate questions of national defense uh, can be met with a tiny fraction of that amount of resources, and that's about the amount of resources that needs to be spent on addressing the climate problem. Uh, it's, it's no more expensive than the money that we are spending now on defending against phantom problems, and it's much cheaper than sitting back and watching the increasing damages that will come from an increasingly violent, disruptive climate that resembles less and less the conditions of life that make it possible for the human race to survive and thrive.